thank you so much, Olivier, um, for the opportunity to be here. It's my first time in Denmark, so I'm very excited. I'm uh, really, really liking it so far. And thank you, you all, for coming. Um, so, as Olivier said, I have kind of a couple different projects going on, and I come from a very dis definite nuclear background. And I'm doing all these projects that have more to do with emerging technologies. And so a lot of what I'm lo looking at is going through this experience of kind of seeing how do nuclear concepts translate to emerging tech? Do they translate? And I just really appreciate the opportunity to kind of test out some of the ideas for the different projects I have. Um, I'm going to be talking mainly about cyber, space, AI, and hypersonic glide vehicles. But you'll notice I'm not talking about a single technology. I'm not going to get into the technical aspects of each of those different technologies. Rather, where I'm at is I'm trying to think about how we frame thinking around these technologies. How do different strategic concepts come into play, particularly the idea of strategic stability? Um, so what I'll start with, um, what I'll kind of cover is I'll start going over the definition of strategic stability, which for anyone who's worked on nuclear knows this is like the most controversial starting point. Uh, and so I'll give you my definition and feel free to challenge me on it. Um, and then I'm going to look at, um, I'm going to focus on crisis stability and risks of escalation and look at how these different technologies might um, impact on the risk of escalation. And then I'm going to talk about some ideas for trying to apply arms control to all these different technologies. Because um, as Olivier knows, I never really wanted to get into the emerging tech space. I was a nuclear person, and that was my bread and butter, and I'm sticking here. And I kept getting a lot of requests from people doing emerging tech research who said, hey, you seem to understand arms control. Can you help us come up with ideas for arms control in emerging tech? And so I've been somewhat dragged kicking and screaming into the emerging tech space, and now I really enjoy it. Um, but arms control is usually my starting point. Um, and with these technologies, I think it's helpful to cyber, space, AI, hypersonics, all very different. But what is it about emerging technology, and these in particular, that make us feel a little anxious, that makes things feel so uncertain and so unstable? And so up front, I wanted to put a few things out there to start thinking about. Um, a lot of the technologies I just mentioned, they're invisible. You can't see them. You can't see the damage. You can't see where it's coming from. And so it just really increases the uncertainty and anxiety around them. Um, a lot of them also get this label revolutionary. And I'll talk a little bit about whether or not that's a fair label. But for example, um, Lucas Kello, in talking about cyber, said that cyber is more like the Reformation than it is like the dawn of the nuclear weapons age. That this is something that is so ubiquitous in changing not just warfare, but changing the way that we as humans operate. So a lot of these technologies feel not just like a military game changer, but like a game changer for our human experience. Um, other reasons that they make us anxious, it's a lack of institutions to regulate them. You know, we don't have a, a chemical weapons convention equivalent for AI yet. Um, these technologies are mainly concentrated among great powers at a time when we're seeing a rise of great power competition. And then the last thing that really makes them hard to kind of grasp and to understand the risks is it's just a rapid rate of change, right? So Stuxnet, which was 10 years ago, is ancient history by cyber terms. And we're still trying to make sense of what happened at Stuxnet and trying to gain the lessons learned. And so to some extent, it's us in the academic fields or even in the policy community, we can't keep up with the technological rate of change and understanding what these technologies mean for strategic stability. Um, so since I had um, my professional start was working for the military, I like to give my bottom line up front, just in case anyone wanders off or you know, it's right after launch, you get tired, whatever. Um, so my bottom line, I'll give it to you now, it is that these technologies themselves are not the source of risk. They aren't necessarily risky. Rather, it's the application of the technologies. And there's a really unfortunate way to capture that, which is guns don't kill people, people kill people. And it's kind of like AI does, might not kill people. Um, but what I'm really concerned about in terms of the application of these technologies and where I'm increasingly focusing my research is on how we're going to use them and incorporate them into strategic doctrine. And the trend that I find most concerning and potentially risky in terms of escalation is how we use strategic ambiguity. 
And we're seeing this particularly in nuclear doctrine just in the past five years. All three of the great, all three of the big powers, US, Russia, China, are becoming increasingly ambiguous in their doctrine and leaving open these huge gray areas of like, Maybe we would use nuclear weapons in these scenarios. Maybe we wouldn't. And that's the space where I think emerging tech is the most dangerous and potentially risky. So that's kind of where I want to get us to by the end of this talk. Um, so first, to, get, to start off um, with, as I said, I promise to try to define strategic stability. Um, strategic stability, the term, really came into fashion during the Cold War. Uh, with Thomas Schelling, Warren Halperin, Bernard Brody, um, and that sort. And the really simple Cold War term was, quote unquote, survivable second strike. So as long as you have a nuclear force that can ride out the first attack, then you have the ability to retaliate. And thus, you have an effective deterrent. This is incredibly simplistic. And we now know that it was a very Western-focused term. The Russians had a totally different idea of what it looked like. But that definition of survivable second strike is really the framework for most of the arms control agreements that we think of. Definitely for START, even for the 2010 New START Treaty. It's trying to find this balance of nuclear forces so that you have an assured deterrent. Um, but as I said, there are lots of different definitions, particularly outside, outside of the US and the West. Um, for Russia, strategic stability was always so much broader. And there are always two defining traits, I think, to Russian strategic stability. The first is the relationship between offense and defense. So from the Russian perspective, it is actually pretty logical when you think about it. Whether or not your nuclear, your first strike gets through depends on whether or not you have defenses. If you have defenses, that's not a stable relationship. You have made yourself less vulnerable. Whereas the other side, if, you, if, you know, if the Russians didn't have defenses, then they are more vulnerable. And so there was this asymmetry in the relationship that the Russians and the Soviets had been calling out for decades. And this is kind of the crux of current arms control debates as well. So for Russia, it wasn't just about, do you have offensive nuclear forces that can ride out an attack? It was, what other capabilities do you have? And then the second really defining trait of Russian approaches to strategic stability was that it wasn't even just about nuclear. They thought about strategy in the round. And one of the terms that we're increasingly seeing in Russian doctrine is, um, I should remember, it, get it right, um, it's what Dima Adamski calls the informational psychological struggle. The informational psychological struggle, which we often mistranslate as cyber. It's not cyber in the way that we think about it. It's trying to change the adversary's way of thinking. And that means manipulation of information, manipulation of their different risk perceptions, threat perceptions. Um, and so there is a cyber component to that, but it's just much more in depth. And you know, to use a, a kind of convenient, though another unfortunate bumper sticker, it's cross domain. So, um, and that's not just the Russians. Um, I've been told, I'm not a China expert, but I've been told that the Chinese take a similar kind of much more holistic view to what defines stability and what does it look like. And in hindsight, and particularly in the current environment, I think the Russians are, are pretty close to getting it right. And you can see that in changes in Western doctrine. We can no longer just think of stability in terms of survi nuclear survivable forces. It has to start incorporating other strategic capabilities. Um, and so here's kind of a final way, a Cold War concept for strategic stability that I think can help us get started which is um, strategic stability depends on two things, arms race stability and crisis stability. And what I want to focus, start focusing in on is crisis stability, particularly with these emerging technologies. Because I, to be honest, I'm not sure the arms race is the best term for talking about cyber or for talking about artificial intelligence. And so arms race stability, I'm just going to park it, but we can come back and talk about it. But talking about crisis stability, so who has incentives to go first in a crisis? That's where these technologies really could have an impact. Um, we have plenty of historical examples to start thinking about how technology will impact on strategic stability. And I'll use um, two examples here. The first was in the mid to late 1960s with the emergence of anti-ballistic missile systems. And the Soviets were the first to start developing these. So again, thinking about the offense-defense balance, if, you, if one side's developing defenses, 
you might have an unstable relationship, whereby if you have the defenses, you might think that you can go first in a crisis and get away with it. And that's not stable. Um, and the other technology at the time was MERV, multiple independently retargetable, right, targetable and reentry vehicles. Sorry, I always butcher that one. Um, but there, it, um, with that, you have an offensive advantage. So again, it's asymmetric, and one side might think that if they go first in a crisis, they can get away with it. So that's also un unstable. And so we think about how these technologies change strategic stability. It changed that perception of offense, defense. And perception is what's really key here, because you don't want one side to think that they can go first and get away with it. Um, this is also when we started seeing kind of, this was like the heyday of arms control. And when you started thinking about how you could use arms control agreements to capture a good equitable balance and to say, OK, we're going to agree to limit our defenses to this. We're going to agree to limit our delivery vehicles to this. So if you can identify that kind of sweet spot for stable balance of forces, you lock it into an arms control treaty. That was the thinking. So there's one example of emerging technologies in the past that had this impact on stability and how we tried to deal with it. To take a very different example would be chemical weapons. And I actually think that chemical weapons are a better analogy for the technologies we're facing now because they're ubiquitous, because it's a dual capable issue. You can't, I mean, in the late, late 19th century, early 20th century, you couldn't deal with chemicals without dealing with the companies that made them. And then seeing how they were being used um, in warfare, and they were actually used. Whereas when we're talking about nuclear arms control, I mean, nuclear weapons haven't been used since 1945, thank goodness. Whereas with chemical weapons, you could see what they did. You could see the physical, the, the, um, physical use and what they did to people. And so it took decades but to get to the chemical weapons convention. But there, and that's multilateral, it tries to involve the private sector. So that's something that's much more pervasive, but takes a lot longer to get to that type of arms control. So that's just kind of another example. Um, and I should, I should have also clarified at the start, when I say arms control, this is, this is one of my pet peeves. I say I work on arms, yeah, I should have gotten that out of the way up front. Um, when I say I work on arms control, I am not talking about disarmament. I'm talking about the management of weapons. There is still a very common misperception um, among policy communities more so, I think, which is which lumps together arms control and disarmament and says, you know, oh, if you're in favor of arms control, then you must be in favor of global zero. That's, that's not quite what I'm talking about here. I'm not saying we, you know, uh, we need to get rid of all cyber. Well, that's just not possible. It's about figuring ways to manage these weapons. Um, so those are the historical examples. And when I first started trying to figure out how to apply arms control to, to emerging tech now, there should be an obvious problem. I said that I'm going to be looking at cyber, space, AI, and hypersonic glide vehicles. All of those are so totally different that trying to address them holistically is a challenge. Um, I'm a lover of typologies, so I've come up with a typology for emerging tech. Three. Um, the first is um, you, it is ubiquitous technologies that have potential military applications. So technology that's just everywhere and unavoidable, if not now, then in this foreseeable future. And that's mainly cyber. Um, it is also AI and space-based assets. So that's the first type. And there is overlap across all three. Um, the second type are military platforms. So this is technology with a specific military function, and that's really hypersonic glide vehicles. Though there are other kind of advanced conventional weapons that will eventually go into that category. So that's the second one. And then the third is information technology. And one of the projects that I have right now, which I'm very excited about, is looking at the impact of social media on conflict escalation. And the project may have been inspired by the American president, but as we're researching it, it's kind of realizing like this isn't just a Trump problem, um, whether or not you think it, that Trump's tweeting is a problem. But I mean, the use of Twitter and Facebook for political signaling is just the way that the world is going to be from now on. And we need to think about how that is going to impact on, on crisis stability. So that's just a snapshot of kind of 
thinking about strategic stability, the definition. So again, my definition is arms race stability plus crisis stability, and for um, emerging tech, focusing on crisis stability. Um, so now I'll, I'll move on to, of these emerging tech technologies, what are the real escalation risks that we're thinking about? So escalation can happen in a couple different ways. It can be um, the most common, or the one that everyone worries about, is unintentional. So misperceptions, misunderstanding of the other side, misunderstanding their signals, not realizing what signals you're sending. And this is the one that I think people get most worried about, particularly with social media. But there are other um, escalation risks. Another is accidental. And so that's different from unintentional, whereby it would be, um, you know, if you, you think that you're about to drop a bomb onto an adversary's military forces and instead you drop it on a hospital. That's accidental, not unintentional. Um, and then the third is intentional escalation. And I would actually argue that in the current environment of geopolitical competition that we have, but also of all the technological uncertainties, I think we need to worry a lot more about intentional escalation than unintentional escalation. I think that more and more countries are going to think that they might be able to escalate in a crisis and get away with it. And there is a bit of an overlap there with misperception of thinking, oh, did we not tell them that they, that they can't get away with it? Was our deterrent message not effective enough? Um, but, in, but seeing how countries are going to try to take advantage of these different technologies. Um, the most common kind of example of that, though I don't like the phrase, is Russia's doct alleged doctrine of escalate to de-escalate. Though that phrase doesn't appear anywhere in Russian doctrine. It's the most common kind of one people talk about. Um, so for the three different types of technologies that I mentioned, I wanted to quickly go through what escalation risks they present. So to the first one, the ubiquitous technologies, cyber, space. Um, there's great research um, primarily by James Acton in the past few years about entanglement. And in September 2018, he had a great article on this in International Security. And there's also a Carnegie report on Chinese and Russian percept perceptions of entanglement. And entanglement really means, um, so nuclear and conventional command and control are co-located in space. In the event of hypothetically a NATO-Russia conflict, if Russia is losing, Russia might target US conventional command and control in space, such as through a cyber attack. The problem is, in the process of taking out America's conventional command and control, you're also taking out the nuclear command and control. That's probably going to lead to a crisis. That's probably going to lead to escalation. And the US has even changed its doctrine um, to say that it would respond to an attack on nuclear command, that it reserves the right to respond to attack on nuclear command and control with nuclear weapons. So that's also quite escalatory. Um, another possible risk of cyber in particular is, I'm guessing a lot of you are familiar with the cyber attribution debate. So if intentional crisis escalation is um, going first in a crisis and thinking you can get away with it, well, if they can't even attribute an attack to you, then you probably can really get away with it. Um, I will admit, I mean, I'd be curious to hear what others think. I'm a little undecided on the cyber attribution debate. Um, ben Buchanan and Thomas Ridd make this great argument that you can actually attribute larger scale cyber attacks um, because not that many countries or actors will have the capability. Um, certain cyber operations leave signatures. But then also, as in any operation, you have to ask, who stands to gain from this? And so if you kind of triangulate those different factors, you might actually have a pretty strong cyber attribution capability. But nonetheless, the risk is there. So that was um, kind of the first of the, type of the different types of tech. I'm looking to the second one on the military platform side. Um, again, James Acton did great research on the risks of hypersonic glide vehicles. And here, again, ambiguity is a real problem. You have destination ambiguity and warhead ambiguity. Um, most hypersonic glide vehicles are probably going to be dual capable, so you won't know if it's a nuclear or conventional weapon on it. But also because, so the hypersonic glide vehicle, um, it gets boosted up, gets right about to the edge of the atmosphere, and when it re-enters, it starts behaving like a cruise missile. So it's flying low and really fast. It's Mach 5. And it's, it's highly maneuverable, 
And so that, crew, that hypersonic glide vehicle could have a range of 2,000 kilometers, or it could be going 3,000 kilometers. And so you just don't know where it's really targeting at. So those types of technologies that just create additional uncertainty, and you're seeing them being developed for a specific military purpose. So that's the second group. And then the third is social media. And what might be the role of social media in a crisis in particular? And here's somewhere where we actually have really great data because you can see how um, people use social media during things like natural disasters. And the biggest concern is that social media will just spread rumors and really, potentially really dangerous rumors and that these can lead to panic. Um, but then there's also this risk of misinterpretation. So if you're in the middle of a crisis and the American president you know, posts a tweet saying um, any attack on our allies will be met with fire and fury, that's going to be read very differently in a crisis than during a time of peace. And so that's, again, it's this ambiguity around the signals. But also you have to worry about on social media is who sent it? If it's coming from this account, is that a legitimate account? Does the person sending it mean what they're saying? Has this been vetted by the administration? There's just so many questions around it. And in a crisis, this becomes harder. Um, to, to really figure out. Um, from the initial research that I've done on the social media cases, I actually have really good news, which I was not expecting. Um, it's that for the most part, even in a crisis, people are really good at di discerning fact from fiction. And it was during one of the really big hurricanes, I think it was a hurricane again in New York a few years ago, um, where there were all these rumors going around on social media about oh, you know, there were like sharks swimming in the streets of Manhattan, or some of them weren't even that, that ridiculous. Um, but one study that was tracking social media at this time found that people, um, people could interpret fact from fiction with 92% accuracy. Again, in a crisis when you're really short on information. But what is concerning about social media in particular um, is that whatever you're getting from social media, usually, I mean, we just do this because we're human, we put it into our pre-existing constructs. And so if you're in a crisis, if the US and Russia are in a crisis, and you start seeing social media about um, you know, one side committing atrocities against the other, or you know, committing atrocities against civilians, if that is your image of what the other side would do, then you're more likely to believe what you're reading on social media. The other issue that you get with social media during crises is what I call sifting fatigue, where um, a, couple, a couple of studies from different simulations have found this, that if you're really short on time and you're being bombarded with information, like tweets, basically tweets or Instagram posts, if you're getting the news cycle and uh, even if you're getting intel reports, the, the social media is really challenging because how do you discern what's the truth and what's the message that the other side is trying to send versus what's garbage? And when you're under significant emotional and time pressures, we're not as good at sifting. We're not as good at saying that's the signal that they want us to get. So social media is still very concerning. Um, and the trend with all of these concerns, as I said, it's ambiguity. It's that a lot of these technologies, we don't know what they're meant to signal. We don't know if they're strengthening, it's meant to strengthen a deterrent or undermine it. And this gets to, um, this is where an old Cold War concept is a bit useful, and that's the idea of strategic ambiguity. And Thomas Schelling had called it the threat that leaves something to chance. One sec. <laughs> Getting parched. And so the assumption with strategic ambiguity is that it'll strengthen your deterrent. That if all you say is, hang on, I'm going to do an example with Olivier. Um, Olivier, if you throw your watch at me, something really bad is going to happen to you. you. You know me, so you know whether or not you can get away with it. Um, but. OK, I'll give you here. You can, but you get the point. Um, saying something really bad is going to happen to you could be much worse or not nearly as bad as you think. But it depends on, again, if you're in crisis mode, 
Do you really want to test somebody during a crisis? How well do you know the other side? What did they have that they could do to you? So if Olivier threw his watch at me, I could just be like, whatever, and walk away, or I could punch him in the face. I'm probably not going to do that. But it's opening up that fear in the adversary's mind. And so the thinking was, and you see this still in a lot of nuclear doctrine, that you just, le that you just kind of let the other side's imagination take it away. And that can strengthen the deterrent. Um, where we're seeing this a lot recently is in nuclear doctrines. Um, last year, the US Department of Defense released its nuclear posture review. And one of the biggest changes in that nuclear posture review was the declaratory policy. So it's saying when you will or you won't use nuclear weapons. And one of the biggest changes was saying, the US said, um, in the event of a non-nuclear strategic attack on US nuclear command and control, the US reserves the right to retaliate with nuclear weapons. Well, what is a non-nuclear strategic attack? At what point in the command and control cycle? Is that really credible? Because it seems, it seems like a pretty disproportionate jump to go to nuclear weapons use. Would the US actually do it? it to some extent, the, the goal here isn't to clarify. The goal is to create uncertainty and to be as ambiguous as possible. Um, Russia did something similar. Um, since about 2000, Russia keeps increasing the ambiguity around its own nuclear doctrine. And so its most recent one, 2014, said that Russia would only use nuclear weapons if the survival of the state is, or existence of the state is at risk. Who decides what's the existence of the state? Does an attack on Russian forces constitute a threat to the existence of the Russian military? It's so ambiguous, and it can be defined really however you want it. And then on China's side, China has a nuclear no first use doctrine, but they really don't say much else about their nuclear forces or what their declaratory policy is. And again, this is really about crisis dynamics. In a crisis, would you trust China's no first use doctrine? Obviously, it depends, but really, this is where strategic ambiguity really comes into place. And what I find most concerning about a lot of these new technologies, but particularly the entanglement idea, is that I think we're trying to increase the ambiguity at a time when we really should be trying to decrease it. And this is something where American and to some extent British strategic studies communities, are, we're all still finding our way. But as I said, this is just what I see as a concerning trend, where for the entanglement argument, you know, James Acton in his article suggests, well, rather than have nuclear and conventional co-located, let's separate them. Yeah, that's one idea. Or let's create more redundancy in the system. Rather than having command and control on six satellites, let's spread it across 12 or even more. The counter argument to that is, no, no, we want that vulnerability. We want to keep this ambiguous because then the Russians would never dare attack our command and control. That's a concerning trend, I think, when you have geopolitical instability and then you add in the ambiguity of all these technologies. So, in the past, arms control was a somewhat useful tool for strengthening strategic stability. Are there any prospects for arms control to try to reduce this ambiguity and work with these emerging techs? Um, there's three, I think, three real goals to arms control. The first is to improve security. Arms control is a reflection of geopolitics. I'm not someone who thinks that detente happened because of SALT. I think the SALT agreement happened because of detente. And so you need to have a geopolitical environment where both sides realize a shared interest in kind of managing their capabilities. Um, second goal of arms control is ethics. So you're trying to reduce the damage of a war happening, reduce, um, so reduce the likelihood of war happening, reduce the damage if it occurs. Um, and then the last real goal is cost. You want to avoid an arms race. Um, but with all the technologies that I've been talking about, it's really challenging right now. The main reason is that if you look at the history of arms control, well, think, of it, so think about technological trajectory. So in your mind, just imagine an XY axis. Think about how that technology develops, where first it's a bit nascent and it's under development and R&D, and all of a sudden it, hits an apple, it gets applied. And it's being used either by the wider public or by the military. So you've got this kind of low trajectory, and then it jumps up 
And then eventually we all get used to the technology and it kind of hits a plateau. Historically, arms control happens when it hits the plateau or when the technology really isn't that useful anymore. Sometimes arms control happens when states just want to give up something. All of the technologies that I've talked about, most of the technologies that I'm talking about are still in that de developmental stage. They haven't even hit the application peak yet, and they're definitely not plateauing. So to some extent, it's just a little too early to really think about concrete arms control the way that we did with nuclear weapons during the Cold War. So that's one challenge. Um, another challenge with how we used to think of arms control is the verification problem. So again, this gets to cyber attribution challenges. Um, but then also, if you're talking about, and this is why the, with these technologies, if they're invisible, how do you verify something that's un invisible? I don't have an answer to that one. If anyone does, I want to hear it. Um, and then the last challenge for a lot of these arms control or a lot of these technologies is that they're dual capable in nature. So any management of these systems is going to require a partnership with the private sector. Um, a common example is uh, there, you know, there's often discussion about how can we regulate cyber risks to critical infrastructure. In the US, 85% of US critical infrastructure is privately owned. If you really wanna manage those risks, you have to build these public private or government private company types of partnerships. Um, and so that's, that, that's a challenge as well. Um, but I'll try to start wrapping up with some ideas. I won't say it's good news, but just to start thinking. So being really ambitious, if we really wanted some sort of legally binding treaty, maybe it has verification, um, controlling some of the most dangerous types of systems. I think that arms control has to, we have to start thinking of arms control asymmetrically. In the past, strategic arms control was, you go down this many, we'll go down this many. We can count this many delivery vehicles. Here's the types that we'll count. And it was usually like for like reductions. Whereas with asymmetric arms control, will sides be willing to maybe reduce in different numbers? Can you make exchanges across domains? Um, I have one example for this, which was actually um, up, up until Friday, um, quite commonly suggested for saving the INF Treaty. And that was the United States accuses Russia of violating the INF Treaty by deploying this missile, the 9M729. Russia has been accusing the United States of violating the INF Treaty with its missile defense interceptors. So the idea would be if you had part of, you could either make it a new agreement or part of the INF Treaty whereby the US would agree to some limit on its missile defenses and the Russians could come in and open up the canister and see, oh, that's, that's not a tomahawk, or we can't put a tomahawk in here. And in exchange, Russia would agree to limit um, cruise missiles and allow the US in to inspect. So that's a non-like-for-like -like exchange involving verification. Now, that's an example with existing technologies. But once we start thinking about strategic stability in that cross-domain way, where it's not just about nuclear weapons, it's not even just about nuclear weapons and missile defense anymore, how do we start incorporating those different capabilities? We have to start thinking asymmetrically. And I'm gonna guess that any of you in this room who don't come from a nuclear background, what I just said is probably super obvious, and you're already thinking that way. In the more nuclear community, this is kind of hard to get traction with. It, because it's just so contrary to how we always think about arms control. Um, other possible opportunities, it's not, going to be our, it's not going to be anything like arms control as we know it. It's going to be cooperative risk reduction measures, probably not legally binding. Um, it could be something as simple as military to military dialogues. This is something that the US and Russia could do right now they're having mill mill problems at the moment. But at some point, <laughs> the US and Russia can sit down and say, here's clarification on our nuclear doctrine. Here's what we mean about cyber threats to nuclear command and control. I mean, that's, this is like a low bar. I don't even know if I'd call it arms control. But then you can get more ambitious. You know, there's like United Nations group of governmental experts. Um, or there's UN efforts right now trying to figure out how to control artificial intelligence. It's not arms control as we know it. It's very different. 
Um, and then a last option, which isn't really arms control, but it's taking unilateral measures to, to try to reduce those ambiguities. So for example, General Hyten, um, former commander of US STRATCOM, um, had said that, how do you phrase it? A human will always be in the loop on nuclear decision making. So that is saying explicitly, artificial intelligence will not be applied to nuclear command and control. I think he's gonna disagree with me, good. Uh, we can discuss. Um, but that's, those types of declarations are ways that you can re reduce the ambiguity and hopefully that says something during a crisis. Um, and some of you might have seen on Twitter, I was debating whether this talk would be optimistic or pessimistic. I'm gonna go with the pessimistic one today. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, overall, um, I'm just extremely pessimistic about the future of arms control. And a lot of us who work on arms control are sitting around asking ourselves, what does the post arms control world look like? Um, so the US announced on Friday, it's formally going to withdraw, or it's given announce, um, notice that it will withdraw from the INF treaty in six months. The New START Treaty expires, um, verification under the New START Treaty expires in 2021. Um, unless that gets extended, we are facing an era with no arms control. And one of the most concerning aspects of that is what it meant, or was the utility of arms control during crisis communications. So supposedly there was a point in the height of the Ukraine crisis when the only communication channel between the US and the Russians was the New START Treaty. If, and so by taking away arms control, we're not just talking about we're taking away verification or we're, you know, there's going to be some new arms race. It's really taking away that crisis communication channel as well. Um, and th that is quite concerning given all the ambiguities that I've talked about. Um, so just to wrap up, um, I'm, I'm going to end with um, a caveat, which is, I, I hopefully have kind of given you a sense of the concerns around strategic ambiguity and that, you know, with emerging tech, we really shouldn't be trying to increase ambiguity. This shouldn't be intentional. At the same time, I am a bit of a believer in some strategic ambiguity. I don't think that the United States, for example, should adopt a no first use doctrine. The question now becomes a lot harder with these emerging technologies. Where is the sweet spot? in strategic ambiguity. And that's a lot harder to figure out um, in the current environment. So um, with all these technologies, vulnerability is going to be unavoidable. Um, but kind of figuring out how to reduce and manage some of those risks is really the challenge, not just for the arms control community, um, but also I think for anyone kind of working on these different tech technology aspects. So with that, I think I'll stop.